Thank you for checking out Value Driven Life. I'm your host, Coach Chris McMahon, and I am very, very, very excited to get to sit down and chat with Dan Feldman. So if you don't know who Dan is, if you're asleep on social media, Dan is a registered dietitian and a personal trainer with a Bachelor of Science in Dietetics and a Master of Science in Human Nutrition. He owns a virtual insurance-based private practice and works part-time as a nutrition researcher for examine.com. He also manages a growing Instagram page, and that's how I kind of was introduced to Dan, uh, at Powerlifter Dietitian, for which he disseminates nutrition and health-based research findings, as well as practical health and wellness tips. When he's not seeing clients or pouring over peer-reviewed research, you can find him jamming on the patio, uh, on the piano or acoustic guitar. Oh, I play both those instruments too. Or telling everyone how cool his dog is. So thanks a lot for being here, Dan. Yeah, man. It's a pleasure to uh, be here. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. So first and foremost, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if people know this. I, I've, seen, I've seen you post videos sometimes. Uh, just to make you feel a little more human for folks, but you you played guitar for quite some time, didn't you? Didn't you want to study in college or play guitar yeah. in college? Yeah, yeah. I haven't been able to play as much lately, just with business stuff getting really busy. But yeah, originally I wanted to be a professional guitarist. That was uh, that was what I wanted to do. That was my jam, no pun intended. Um, you know, from from probably about two thousand eight uh, to like. 2012 I was kind of obsessed with playing acoustic guitar and um wanted to be a professional guitarist um yeah and then was going to study music in in college um and then just decided like you know what this is more of a hobby for me because you know mm-hmm. after practicing like hours and hours and hours every single day it eventually came to be like almost like a bit more like work and it kind of lost its fun yeah i i went to school uh for vocal performance in musical theater. So I sang for like eight to 10 hours every single day for 40 years and also played play piano and play guitar. And I, there's just such a big part about that that can be a lot. But what's really, really cool is that, and folks listening to this will probably have this, like when you find some sort of passion or some sort of thing that you can actually enjoy and lean into, it, it does open up so many different opportunities for you. And I don't know if you find this with what you're doing right now, because, you know, you're also training folks, you train yourself and you're, you're consistently working with all this different types of information. Do you ever find yourself feeling that same feeling that you had when it came to music because you do it all day, every day now? Yeah. So one thing that music and, and, and getting very proficient guitar and piano really taught me was how to apply myself, how to be, um, focus my energies on something that I'm really passionate about and how to kind of use that to fuel, I guess, self-discipline because, you know, this is kind of speaking more generally, but I think with anything that's really hard, and, or I should say anything that's really, that's worth doing in life, any, any, any really big goal that you want, whether it be to become a world-class guitarist, whether it be to build your own business, you know, I'm sure there may be people listening who want to build a nutrition coaching business or become a registered dietitian. All those things take a lot, a lot of work over a long period of time. So what guitar really taught me was to put the instant gratification aside and work at something every single day for an outcome that's going to be a long ways from now. Same thing with powerlifting. You know, it's the same thing. You, you don't get strong. I'm not that I'm super strong or, but you know, I'm, I'm I, I can hold my own in, in local meets. Um, same kind of thing. You know, you don't just go to the gym and you're instantly able to deadlift, you know, three times your body weight. But, but um, you know, with, with you, you put in the work every training session um, and then the results come. Same thing with starting a business, you know, and becoming a dietitian. You know, those are hard things to do. But, you know, if you put in the work every single day, and and you you um, accept you embrace the fact that it's really challenging, and you know over a long period of time, if you learn to enjoy the process, you one day you look and you're like, oh, I I have a thriving business, or like, oh, I am able to develop three times my body weight, you know? Yeah, yeah. So Dan, this is really really interesting because I think this is the thing that that usually stand, tends to get wrapped up 
for certain individuals who are getting started in this whole this wellness journey, whether that be that they want to lose weight, whether that be they want it, maybe they want to start powerlifting and they've never worked out before, right? It could be whatever spectrum someone is at an entry point. Usually this concept of having of having patience and trusting in the process and and really taking your time with it sometimes can be missing, especially because we live in a world where suddenly instant gratification is is this thing, right? We order on Amazon, it's here in a day, maybe a couple hours. We we um, we see everyone's dramatic before and after photos. It's like, oh, okay, well, if I can do that in in six weeks, in 12 weeks, well, that's that's great. I'm signing up, I'm, I'm doing this. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting because, because your take on it, if folks aren't following you on, on Instagram, they'll be able to see everything in the uh, show notes. But what's interesting on your take is, one, you have the knowledge that's very apparent. Two, the level of self-awareness and self-compassion you have when you are talking about these concepts is what I think can be missing sometimes, right? It's it's very middle of the road. You know, someone someone who might be like still research-based, know all this information, but automatically subtract the idea that we're human. You know, a great example is um, Lane Norton. Is He's got t-shirts that say uh, data is greater than feelings, and that's true. You know, that is true because sometimes we get wrapped up in this idea that our identity <laughs> has to eliminate the fact of what the data says. And you don't do a wonderful job of kind of living in the middle where it's like, yep, this is true. But also you can also have these feelings or have this experience. Yeah. So, Dan, I guess my question for you is it's probably multi-layered, but where do you think that starts for you? Where do you think that that your ability to have that level of self-awareness or self-compassion around this sort of experience, where do you think that started for you? Where it started for me? Well, I guess I don't know, but um, I guess just to kind of more so, okay, I don't, I don't really know where that started for me, but I guess just kind of more so talking a bit generally you know, the, the kind of data and science side of things, you know, I, I, I that really, it, during my master's program, that's something that I really started to appreciate more and more and more is, is relying on peer reviewed data and, and reading research. And, you know, when you, when you provide guidelines, when you help people they, they, to make sure that you are following evidence-based guidelines and that you are staying abreast of the current literature. Um, but we always kind of have to balance that with the fact that when we're working with clients um, or just talking to people on social media, we're talking with humans, you know, we're, 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 we're not looking at things in a vacuum, you know, so we can kind of use the peer reviewed findings, but at the same time, we need to also be humans. And, and, and oftentimes when we are working with people or we're trying to communicate a message on social media, a lot of people, I mean, some people don't, but but the majority of people kind of know what healthy looks like for them, you know? I mean, carnivore diet aside, most people know that fruits and vegetable eating more, most people know that they probably ought to eat more fruits and vegetables, right? You know, maybe drink more water, maybe, you know, kind of general population, maybe move their body more regularly, you know what I mean? Or they want to start lifting weights, you know, things like that, or, or get to bed at a regular time, you know what I mean? Like, most of us know this. Um and it's not so much oftentimes telling people, hey, you need to be in a calorie deficit to lose weight. Oh, sometimes it is. Sometimes I'll have a client where they just think it's just their hormones. and You know what I mean? But but more often than not, there's a little bit of education that, that is required, but more so compassion. You know, giving someone space to go feel what they're feeling and express their feelings and then kind of gently guiding them using you know, motivational interviewing, which, you know, if you've got any coach it, help the coach it, nutrition coaches, personal trainers listening, and you haven't already looked into motivational interviewing, I highly recommend that you do so. Um, there's actually a book that I, uh, you know, uh, can check when I have a chance that I recommend everyone listen to, um, basically about nutrition, um, uh, motivational interviewing for um, nutrition professionals. You know what I mean? Yeah. Basically, it's the idea of guiding people through behavior change, but we're not necessarily telling them what to do, but we're more so, you know, kind of, kind of 
uh, using someone's past experience to give them um, the space to talk and just kind of talk about what they're going through because we know that that's therapeutic, asking open-ended questions, giving affirmations, accurate affirmations to, um, uh, to help you know, uh, someone be more motivated and be more confident, reflecting people's statements, you know, just because oftentimes when people sort of hear back what they're saying, they can really kind of digest it and it can really sort of help them um, uh, find the motivation within themselves, you know, and then um, setting goals um, with people, you know, um, you know, as opposed to assigning people goals. Uh, so basically, I kind of went off a bit of a tangent, but people oftentimes don't necessarily need to be told what to do. Like, yes, the data is data, but at the same time, we also have to be human with people. Actually, as coaches, dietitians, what have you, personal trainers, want to facilitate behavior change. If we just want to educate and that's it, that's different than um, helping people change their behaviors. So yeah, yeah. we need to I kind actually- of, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't think you went off on too much of a tangent because because you actually covered multiple layers to the question in and of itself. Yeah. Because because yeah, the research is even out there that self-efficacy is is going to be more of a more of a deciding factor whether someone can adhere to whatever choices that they're making, right? It's mm-hmm. it's 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 a partner ship it's a it's a dance it's not a single person on their own especially yep. when you're working with a coach and hopefully if you're listening and you are working with a coach you have this sort of relationship where you can actually say what's going on and not be afraid of the response of your coach yeah right that that's a big part of it um when that's missing it's usually like oh no i'm really messing up right now i'm going to really disappoint someone right now let me not say what's happening let me yeah. not actually talk through this when in fact that that's a part of it. It's, it's why are we making this choice? What's the pattern that keeps showing up? How can we actually begin to move towards different, different uh, behaviors? Exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Now, something you brought up, Dan, <laughs> it was actually something that you put on Instagram, like maybe, maybe last week. And I just thought it was hilarious, but unfortunately it's, it's people see it and they're like, you know, no, I should do this. It was in spe- uh, specifically talking about um, carnivore diet, carnivore MD. He put oh, up God. this whole. Vi- he put up this whole vi- for folks who don't know. Um, Doctor, I don't even know. Is is it Paul Saladino? Yeah, this person. Yeah. So Paul Saladino, he is the carnivore MD. He's someone who, you know, is shirtless and wears his <laughs> doctor coat and uh, his white coat and goes into stores and tells you what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat. Mostly what you should not eat. Yeah, (laughs) based off fear tactics, unfortunately, or misinterpreting research. Um, And the thing you put up was about, he said you shouldn't basically bathe or wash yourself with soap or brush your teeth. Yeah, he Uh, was saying, and by the way, just really quickly, um, I mentioned a book a minute ago on motivational interviewing. It's called Motivational Interviewing and Nutrition and Fitness by Don Clifford and Laura Curtis. It's on Audible. I've been listening to it. I highly recommend any nutrition coaches, personal trainers would have you listen to it. But okay, just putting that in there. <laughs> Sorry, continue. No, it's all right. So so for you, I feel like this is a big thing. Um, how can someone begin to not get wrapped up in that? Because I, I you know, I talked with uh, Dr. Adrian Chavez about this too. This idea of like there being like, fear surrounding data because let's say someone wants to go and read research right some maybe even some of the things that are being cited right and you read it and maybe you don't know how to read research so you're just like you read the summary and you're like yeah i guess they're right i'm gonna avoid i'm gonna avoid mushrooms because they're really bad for you because they're a nightshade because x or y right so how, how does someone even begin to start there like how did how do you It's tough. I think the first thing to understand is, and I know it's kind of ironic because I obviously have a social media presence and 25,000 people or whatever follow me, but, you know, a lot of people on social media, even people who have credentials, you know, I'm not trying to, trying to, you know, uh, talk shit about Paul Saladino. I did that enough in my, my Instagram, but, but, you know, he does have, 
he does technically have an MD. I think it's I think it's a doctorate in like uh, psychiatry, but technically he is he does have MD. You know what I mean? And there are other a lot of other people, even dietitian registered dietitians, I see just put up complete bullshit about how this food is terrible for you. And and the, the thing to understand is that unless you've got an allergy, like a really specific allergy there really are no good or bad foods. I know I posted about, I, I have this like one graphic that I post like every three months, like just always. And basically it's, it's kind of showing food as a spectrum where on one side of the spectrum, there's foods that you want to eat more often in larger quantities, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lean proteins, etc. And then, uh, and then other foods you want to eat smaller quantities of less often, you know, uh, a lot of pro uh, calorie dense processed foods, cakes, cookies, you know, pizza, I don't know, whatever. And, and, and more to kind of have that relaxed approach towards nutrition, because, you know, the, the idea that, that there are foods that are inherently bad, that you eat them and they instantly somehow cause disease or something like that is grossly oversimplistic. I think that we have to realize that the body is relatively resilient you know i mean and, and it's it's not like again unless we're eating poison or something most of the time we eat something that's edible we break it down you know we digest and assimilate the nutrients whether that be a donut you know whether it be or carrots whatever it is you know what i mean so so really kind of seeing things on that spectrum and really appreciating the fact that our body there's no judge within our body that says this is good or this is bad, you know? And understand that most of the time when people are demonizing foods, they are either grossly misinterpreting like a, a mechanism by which something can happen or they're just completely wrong. Like, um, I don't need to pick on him, but whatever. Like Paul Saladino, he has this whole thing on his Instagram where, you know, plants have defense chemicals and because they have those defense chemicals, we eat them and they are bad for us and cause inflammation, whatever, which is completely wrong. But, you know, they, like it's the, one of those things where if I was an insect, you know, like um, like capsaicin, you know, it's 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 uh, stuff that makes stuff spicy. You know, it is I guess it would fall in that category of, of like a plant defense chemical so that when insects try to eat plant, it's they they you know, they don't eat it anymore. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it drives them away. But for us, it's nice and spicy, you know? Why? Because we're not insects. You know what I mean? And, and, and just, I guess just being really skeptical of everything you see with regard to health on social media, particularly when someone is being very alarmist, because when being alarmist, is what gets people views like much of the time when people are posting on social media they want to make it they want to make something that gets likes and gets engagement and you know a post talking about how fruits and vegetables are good for you is not doesn't get your attention because it's boring because much of what's true about nutrition is nuanced and kind of boring to be honest with you like generally speaking common sense what, what kind of most people think of as common sense in terms of nutrition, you know, like the government guidelines, generally pretty accurate, you know, on a population level. And, and you know, the stuff that really gets your attention is stuff that's surprising, stuff that's eye-catching, which is also stuff that's incorrect. You know, plant defense chemicals being bad for you, and, and it's all a big conspiracy with the government and, you, and vegetables being horrible for you. Like, that's, like, what? No. You know what I mean? And, and just, like, stuff like that. Um, so just being very skeptical whenever you see something that that doesn't really jive with common sense or something that's very, very different than conventional wisdom. I'm not saying conventional wisdom is always wrong because we do kind of learn stuff over time and that's probably part of what science is, but just being really skeptical when, when you see things that are, like I said, alarmist or super out of the ordinary. Uh, yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, no, that really does answer the question. And this idea of learning as we go is is so important. In my in my own journey, like I had no idea about anything, especially when I first started, you know, over over 10 years ago, when I first started working as a coach, it was 
you know, I, I didn't go to school for any of this. I didn't, all I knew was what people told me and I didn't have the knowledge or understanding to go ask other questions or to be skeptical. And for you, Dan, when you were going through this before, before you started your master's, before you, before you decided to switch from music, how was your understanding of all this? Or how did you, how did you kind of decide to switch to have better understanding? Yeah. Well, I mean, there was definitely a pretty long period of time where I did sort of buy into bullshit, you know, back in the 2013, 2014 era where keto was really like keto was like, everyone was talking about keto. I bought into that. I thought keto, I thought carbs made you fat because of insulin. Um, I followed this guy. And I don't know if you remember this guy, John Kiefer, who was uh, really into carb backloading, basically the idea that, you know, if you could, if you only eat carbs after your workout at night, that you will, all of the nutrients will go to the muscle and you'll just be jacked and super lean. That's bullshit. But, but I, I totally bought into that. You know what I mean? Cause I didn't really know better and he used fancy scientific jargon. Um, so I don't think it was really until I started following people who really actually did know what they were talking about. Like, I think my introduction and kind of the evidence-based fitness space was um, probably, I think Mike Matthews, who, who's like from Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, um, who, who um, generally, you know, uh, uh, has, has very evidence-based content. And then, you know, I got into the work of like Eric Helms and, and reading the Nutrition and Strength Pyramids and, and um, you know, uh, Stronger by Science. And, and I started following folks who were really, more so evidence-based and who more so took that more evidence-based approach. And then from that time when I started my master's, I really got into reading research and everything kind of clicked from there. So it was a journey, you know what I mean? You kind of, uh, you, you learn as you go on, you know, and I think that's, it's also important kind of along those lines that if someone is kind of buying into more of the pseudoscientific stuff, not to judge them too much. And it's tough, especially on social media, like, everyone just insults everyone else on social media. Like when I post, when I posted the thing about the, the, the Paul Saladino saying you shouldn't use toothpaste or soap or shampoo, people were like, no, you shouldn't. He's totally right. You know what I mean? And you're, and you're just an idiot dietitian. Like, what do you know? You know, like, so, you know, but, but um, yeah, if you are someone, you're just kind of getting into this and you're really kind of confused, generally speaking, like common sense is is generally going to be what's 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 going to be uh, the thing that that you should kind of focus on. Um, you know, like I said, um, if you don't already follow, you know, the folks from Stronger by Science and and the and like um, you know the uh, folks over at, at Monthly Applications and Strength Sports. You know, Eric Trexler, Eric Helms, Greg Knuckles, Mike Zerdos. They do a really great job of kind of summarizing literature and practical applications obviously i mean i'm biased because i work for examine but you know at examine we kind of do the same thing where we uh, try to kind of provide practical recommendations based on data you know what i mean so so um you know finding the right people to follow i would say was yeah. something that really helped me there um, as well also james trigger he's got a research review called the weightology research review which is really good if you're into like like uh, YouTube type content, Jeff Nippard probably got the best content on YouTube or one of some of the best content on YouTube that's evidence-based with kind of fitness and nutrition stuff. Um, so, you know, finding the right people to follow. What I would say. Yeah, I think that that is really important, especially for folks who are maybe they're struggling with social media, like, right? The, maybe they are, they have so many people, so many accounts that they follow that it's really easy to go on there and feel overwhelmed or feel like they're doing everything wrong or feel so this concept of like curating your social media so it's actually helping versus yeah. feeling like you are I don't know feeling like you're lost at all turns you know it, it's something that's really really important and to go back to what you were saying it, you know it is a slow process this this all of it it, curating your feed, uh, making any sort of nutritional changes, making sort of any training changes, like it's a slow process. And I think that's something that people aren't in love with. I think yeah. that's also why like the common sense approach is like, well, that 
well, then that just means that like I shouldn't eat X or Y in massive quantities all the time. Well, yeah, probably. Right. And that's I think that's the thing that's really hard for folks. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Like, how does some how does someone even begin to start to slow down and understand it's okay that it's going slow? Yeah. And basically accepting the fact that anything worth doing is going to take more time and more hard work than you want. That's with anything in life. You know, I mean, we are, I think, not naturally wired for instant gratification. I'm sure there's an evolutionary advantage to that, but whether it be, you know, weight loss, gaining muscle or building a business, building a coaching business, it will take more time than you want. It will take longer than you want. It will require more patience than you want, more hard work than you want. But once you can accept that, anything, okay, like, or even like, you know, even if like you have a dream of buying a house, you know what I mean? It takes a while to kind of, to, to, to kind of, uh, um, save enough money for that you know what i mean it, it just everything worth doing requires a lot of time and a lot of hard work but that's what makes it worth doing same thing if you've got 50 pounds to lose no you're not going to lose you know 14 pounds in seven days you know under, at least except maybe if, or maybe you will but you'll you know it's not gonna be sustainable so so just coming to a place of acceptance of that and learning to enjoy the journey and, and one thing i remind myself and again this is more so with just any sort of lofty goals that I have on, um, you know, financial goals or powerlifting goals is, you know, just imagining, okay, I'm doing this for 2023, Dan, or 2024, Dan, you know, today, as we're recording it, it's recording this, it's June 20th, 2022. I'm investing in myself, you know, um, so that one, two, three years down the line, I'll have the life that I want, you know. Because what, what's a year? What's two years? You know, life life goes quickly, you know. Um, so, you know, why, why not? I'm going to I'm gonna really put in the hard work now and I will enjoy the benefits later. Yeah, I think that that is, Dan, that is something that's super special. You know, I think it's the fact that zooming out and understanding what you can accomplish within that amount of time is very different than looking at what I can accomplish in three months. Mm -hmm. Although there is, you know, there is benefit to looking at what you can do in three months in a block, but it's a long game. All of this is a long game. And I know for me, my struggles have always been not, it hasn't really been a fitness thing. It's been a it's been a being enough thing, doing enough thing. Is this enough? You know, and the more I work with folks, the more I realize, oh, yeah, no, this is like a thing that everyone has. Yeah. It's just what form does it come in? For some folks, it's I have to be a certain weight and then I'll be enough. For other folks, it's I have to I have to have this number in my bank account and then I'll be enough. For another person, it could be I have to have this partner. And then I'll be enough. Yeah. There's always this question of what is enough? How do I define enough? Dan, for you, like in your life, how does that begin to manifest or show up? Because you you sound like you have a, a level head on your shoulders where you're like, yeah, I'll look I'll look out big picture big picture wise. But um, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I just try to remind myself that, you know, I'm never going to be 100% satisfied with my life. There's always going to be things that I want and don't have. You know, I'd love to be taller. I'm five foot four. And I'm probably not I'd be very surprised if I got taller than that because I'm 28. But, you know, there's always going to be things that we don't want and like things that um, we, we wish were different. That's just how life is. That's how being human is, you know. Even if you get everything that you that you want, you're eventually going to want more. And even if you don't, even if you get everything you ever wanted, eventually you're going to die. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so like, kind of just keeping that in mind, like, all right, like, there's going to be some shit that we're just not going to be able to do to, to get. Or if we do, then we're going to want some other shit that we're not going to be able to get. If we somehow get all of that, like I said, we're going to get sick because that's just what happens. Our family members are going to get sick. And everyone we know and love is going to die, which sounds really morbid, 
but I don't mean it that way. Because then once you kind of accept that aspect of life, then you don't take life quite as seriously, which I think is huge. Like if you can, if you can strike the balance between being patient and working your ass off with, for the things that you want and accepting that they're not going to come right away and they might just take a long time and you don't get too attached to things because you remind yourself, Hey, eventually we're all going to die anyway. Like we don't want to get too attached to outcomes. That's really where the beauty happens because then you're not attached to the outcome itself. You're more so focused on the process of working really hard, enjoying the, you know, something that gives me fuels kind of my passion is just achieving hard things and the hard, the process of the hard is something that I really enjoy. You know, like I said, with powerlifting, you know what I mean? Overcoming obstacles and plateaus, um, same thing with my business. And, and that's really what I enjoy. And if you can enjoy that aspect of the process, you can enjoy that kind of difficult, you know, that sort of resistance. Um, like when, when we go to the gym, you know, if, 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 um, you know, I'm really, really into powerlifting. One thing I love about it, I kind of love the pain in a weird way of like when you go to the gym and it's really hard and you're exhausted and, and, um, you can feel the lactic acid building up, you know, I'm sure people listening can relate to this. Like it's kind of what makes lifting fun, you know, cause you know that that's going to lead to growth. So kind of looking at, at, at different, um, goals you have for yourself, different obstacles in that same way. That is really how you can achieve what you want and enjoy the process. Uh, mm. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I think that in and of itself, you know, there are so many people who, who tote this idea of um, loving the process, loving loving what's happening. And I think what you what you're shining a light on is loving the the challenge. You know, I, I wish I can remember which book I was reading, but they were specifically talking about this whole idea of of really, truly, we have to make a bunch of mistakes like we we have to. Like we have to make mistakes or things have to not go according to plan because it's the only way you can actually learn and can t continue to develop to actually be able to do something different or to see some sort of growth. Yeah. And, and the minute we don't have that, the minute everything is handed to you, like Dan, it would be like if you walked into the gym and you just back squatted like 500 pounds, like, and you were like, oh, this is super easy. The likelihood of you probably always wanting to continue powerlifting would would decrease there's no there's no challenge there's no very boring very quickly right and i think that's what folks easily lose sight of of how how boring it is when things are extremely easy there's yeah. a difference between there's a difference between ease and then there's a difference between like just just showing up and it's always easy you know yeah. i i can't really define that a better way but i think it's really something that's very important to be able to recognize um if someone was to come to you dan and and be working with you and be having a hard time finding this level of understanding about the difficulty or about the process of this because an example would be like for me if someone came to me and they're like i do want to lose like 30 pounds in the next like four weeks before i go on my summer vacation right it's like how do you begin to even explain like the cost, how, how, what, what goes into that? Is that sustainable? Like what can be difficult that we can actually focus on? Yeah. So with that person, one thing I would um, first kind of ask them is why, you know, why, why, why do you want to lose 30 pounds before the next vacation? You know what I mean? What, what will that bring you? Um, you know, and take things from there. Maybe they say that they'll be more comfortable in, in your bathing suit and, and, um, you know, they'll be able to take better pictures. And, you know, I might ask, you know, why, um, why is that important to you? And, and then we might be able to kind of talk on some deeper level as to, to what it is they really want. You know what I mean? And, and, and maybe talking a bit about, you know, their past and what they've tried before. You know, oftentimes when people come to me with, with those sorts of goals, they mention that they've kind of had a lifetime of kind of stick with dieting. You know, I might want to ask, it's like, how has that sort of process been of kind of stick with dieting? I was kind of trying to lose weight. You know, and then maybe talking about what it is we really want and why, you know, what will the weight loss give us? Is it self-confidence? You know, um, well, there's other ways we can we can um, achieve self-confidence. Maybe they do want to lose weight, but maybe 
you know, uh, after kind of talking through someone's why a bit, you know what I mean? And, and really sort of getting to really give them the space to talk more about their goal and their, their background. Maybe we can set some, uh, some, some process goals, you know, uh, that might get us in the direction of weight loss, but, you know, at the same time, just digging a little bit deeper in that initial kind of lofty goal and, and um, you know, seeing sort of where that's coming from, you know, so kind of giving someone the space to talk through that, you know, because oftentimes we sort of know on some visceral level, you know, if we have a goal of losing 30 pounds in a month, we know that that may not really be attainable. Um, but oftentimes maybe we have that goal with that sort of cut related to something else, you know what I mean? And um, I think getting to the heart of that when, when we're working with someone is is hugely important, you know, getting to know their why. Yeah, I think it is something that uh, most coaches, at least the coaches that I'm aware of, are aware of. You know, that's a very fortunate thing. It's it's very it's very introductory to understand or to be able to gain that from someone, but also kind of complicated in the beginning when you're not used to tiptoeing yeah. around that or even asking those questions. And if someone wants to figure that out for themselves, let's say they're not working with a coach, but they want to have this clarity around like why any of this is important. Do you have any sort of go-to tactics that you would use? I think that kind of going through your whys, you know, and kind of like I was saying, okay, your goal is to lose however much weight. Be honest with yourself. Why is that important to you? You know, is it important because you feel like you're supposed to lose weight? Like it's just what, because you're, you're not whole and complete as you are now. Is it because your cholesterol is high and your doctor is concerned? Is it because you um you know want to be more attractive like kind of really getting to the heart of that um you know seeing if there are seeing what it is we really want you know and i guess addressing that because oftentimes the weight loss oftentimes it's it's not necessarily about just the food or about the weight and there's something deeper there so really being honest with yourself you know about that i think is is, is hugely important yeah yeah that self the ability to be honest and to to figure all this out is kind of it could be scary yeah you know it could be it could be very scary and very imi imitating uh for someone yeah intimidating yeah for for yeah. someone to kind of like just be able to say what they actually want and understand that it might not have anything to do with that specific weight goal or or specific look yeah. it's it it's just it's just a strange feeling or a strange thing to be able to identify within your own life dan as, as you've been training and doing all this if you feel comfortable talking about this i because i i heard you on another podcast uh i believe it was like um Alyssa olnick's podcast the messy middle podcast and you were talking about your your journey with with strength training and your journey with finding a different relationship with food and and everything I feel like a, a lot of your why for what you were doing at that phase in your life was was probably different than where it is right now. Yeah. And that in and of itself might have been a scary portion of your journey for you as you can reflect on it now. Are you comfortable with talking about that or is it? Yeah, I think it was a pretty gradual process. You know, there was a time where I really wanted to get shredded and get a six pack because I don't know, I thought it would help me with the with, um, attracting the opposite sex or, you know, I thought it would just make me more attractive in general, you know, and there was a time where I wanted to get super, super strong just so I could compete at like the national level at USAPL or whatever it is, you know, my, my sites were more kind of set in that direction, very outcome based. And I don't think there was any one kind of a hot moment. I think it was just kind of a gradual process when I kind of realized that it's always kind of the approach that I took in my life with anything I ever wanted was to try and get the outcome. And then once I have that, I'll be happy. You know, once I have that, I'll be whole and complete. And eventually at some point I realized like there's always just going to be shit that I want. And, and the joy is in, is in striving for that, at least for me. The, the, the joy is really in, you know, setting, uh, challenging goals you know what i mean and setting lofty goals and, and hitting them 
um, you know, we're working towards them. That's really the joy in and of itself. If that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was kind of just a gradual process. And like I said, now I kind of see the, the process of attaining those goals as a joy in and of itself, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it does make sense. And I think, you know, I think it's really refreshing or or wonderful for people to be able to hear someone who has this you have a big arc to your story or a big arc to your journey from where yeah. you started to where you are right now. And if I venture to guess, I would have to say that's probably why your awareness around self-compassion and the necess how necessary it is for what you do and how you work with people where it comes from because if you think back to where you were when you were in high school or when you were a freshman in college and, and what you felt and what you were dealing with, that's incredibly human. And I do not think enough coaches have that level of self-awareness, not to judge anyone, but it's just from what I've heard, from what I've seen, even my own personal experience. Like I, I've dealt with depression and anxiety and alcoholism like I, I've dealt with all of that and I feel incredibly fortunate to be where I am right now and to have that level of understanding surrounding my own journey because it impacts my ability to to sit and listen to someone else struggle through their journey and provide feedback or provide different tool whatever it might be yeah. um so I didn't know if maybe that also felt a little similar for you too. It's it's this level of understanding that that maybe not everyone will have. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean I think completely, and I think kind of building on your point, I do think that having gone through like a lot of shit. This is one other thing. Again, I don't know how related it is to your question, but um, having gone through a lot of shit. Um, like you mentioned, like I've also, you know, struggled with anxiety. I still struggle with anxiety. Um, in fact, kind of like a side note, the anxiety, I mean, it's kind of well controlled, but I, I do think that anxiety is partly what kind of helps me be successful in sort of a weird, sick way. You know what I mean? But besides the point, having gone through a lot of shit, anxiety, depression, you mentioned alcoholism. I mean, I've, uh, I won't get too personal, but I've gone through some, some, you know, mental health struggles and, and just, just, just a lot of shit that I've had to go through. And I do think that to a very large extent, what you go through can make you stronger. I know it sounds kind of corny, but just kind of like when we go to the gym and the pain that, that we're in at the gym, physical pain, you know, not, not that that directly leads to, to strength, but, you know, we go to the gym, it's hard, and then eventually we get stronger. I think it's kind of the same thing just with life in general, you know, uh, where we go through things. And then if we're able to utilize them as practice opportunities, we're able to utilize and we're able to reframe them. We can look back and say, holy shit, I went through that and I'm still here. I can go through what I'm going through now, and I know it's going to be OK. You know, and, and it's something I remind myself as well, you know, that like, hey, as hard as what I'm going through right now is. I've been through that, you know, and if I could go through that and I can get here, I can go through this challenge. Um, you know, I think a lot of courage, can, you can kind of really derive a lot of courage and a lot of self-confidence from that. Yeah, you know, you bring up a really good point. And it's this idea of if you just go back and look at where you've come from or where what's been uh, the milestones or the check marks in your history or your past, you'll always find that when you say this is the worst moment or this is this can't get any worse or I feel incredibly less than or whatever, you can definitely go back in your past and be like, oh, wait a minute. No, that was way worse. Yeah, that right. was way worse. Like now you have a different vocabulary or a different level of understanding of like, oh, no, 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 no. That's actually what what rock bottom is. Yeah. OK, so what <laughs> like let's begin to diffuse the situation a little bit and understand how we can start to move forward from there so yeah. i think that's really interesting and um i appreciate your 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 transparency and your ability to to talk about that yeah man my uh my uh pleasure if my lived experience can help anyone it's that's that's what's most important to me yeah i and i find i feel the same way too just because 
I don't know. For me, I I find it became more apparent to me after I had uh, my wife and I. We had our our son. I I just I look at him and you know in therapy they you know they talk about your inner child and it's very woo woo. But when you look at someone who's like a pint sized version of you, yeah, it's very you're very much like aware that you don't want them to break themselves. Sure. And I think every human being has the ability to be aware of that. You don't want someone else to break themselves or to put themselves in a position where they don't need to be in that position. Yeah. And Dan, I just, I, I, I truly appreciate the fact that you work so hard to, to help others from, from going down that route or whatever it might be, whether that be from the followers you have on social media or the patients that you work with or the clients that you have or the power lifters you work with, you know, it's all, it's all of these different things. So I don't know. I hope that gives you a little boost today, but I, I also, that, I, I just want you to be aware that what you're doing actually matters a lot. If, if folks want to work with you, Dan, how, how can they do that? Um, if, if, uh, folks do want to work with me, then I would say shoot me an email at Dan at Dan Feldman, rd.com. Um, that's generally the best way to get in touch with me. Most of my clients, at least for, you know, nutrition and nutrition coaching or, or whatever you want to call it. Cause, cause, you know, cause since I, I, I generally, um, take people's health insurance and we go through it that way. Um, like I said, most of my clients use their health insurance. Um, a lot of them, majority of my clients actually don't actually pay for my services because insurance covers it. That's United States specific. But, um, you know, you can reach out to me via email if you're just more interested in like, oh, who is this guy, Dan Felton? Like, what, 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 who, who is this person? You can follow me on Instagram. I'm kind of a uh, powerlifter dietitian, like, like you had mentioned at the beginning, just to get an idea of who I am. Um, at some point down the road, Maybe within like the next year or so, I'm probably going to start uh, uh, building up some resources for, you know, coaches and dietitians or, or people who want to kind of start their own business and who, who um, you know, want to be kind of helping other people in that way. Because I do think it's something that, uh, you know, a lot of people do want to maybe dietitians who want to have a private practice or people who do want to start a business and be helping other people in this way, but don't know where to start. So that's something that's on the horizon, but, um, but yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, everyone will be able to get to that information in the show notes. And Dan, the, the last question I usually ask folks is a, a bit of a thinker for some people, but maybe someone will pop out for you since we've been kind of talking about all this, but if you could go back in time, you can choose whether you go the Avengers route or you hop in a DeLorean, whatever you choose. If you could go back to your future self, at this or your past self at the start of your career or at the start of your lifting career, whatever you choose. And you can give yourself like one piece of advice, not necessarily to change anything, but just a little wisdom that you could give yourself. What do you think that would be? None of this matters. <laughs> I would say none of this matters because, you know, um, and this is actually something every day, whenever I'm anxious, I, re I tell myself this kind of like as though it was my future self. If you think about all the things, maybe it's different. Like if you're a parent, this shit kind of matters, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like I, I don't have any kids. So it's, it's you know, like if, if, if you're a parent, like obviously take care of your kids. But, but you know, just, just for more daily kind of annoyances that oftentimes you find yourselves upset about things or, you know, frustrated at things. I don't know, like the Instagram algorithm isn't showing your posts like you want, you know what I mean? Or your car is being annoyed. I, I don't know, just like most of the things that we get really anxious about, upset about, worried about in 10 years, you're not even going to remember what it was. You know what I mean? Most most of the things that we're upset about or that cause us negative emotions on a daily basis. So, and I mean, like I kind of said, and this sounds, I don't mean this in a morbid way. This is when I kind of reflect on this, it actually kind of takes a lot of the pressure off of me that I put, I put a lot of pressure on himself. So it takes the pressure off is that again, none of this matters and eventually we're all going to die. So like, don't take things quite as seriously. And that kind of sounds like it goes into this is to, to what I was saying about working really hard, but I don't think it does because I think if you can work really hard and know what your goals are, 
and had a, a plan. And at the same time, just enjoy that process and not take life too, too seriously when things go wrong and understand that things will go wrong because that's just how things are. You know, th we, we try and, and, and work hard towards things. There are obstacles that come up. They're supposed to come up, but it's just they make the, the journey uh, more worthwhile. And remember, ultimately, it doesn't matter. And um, like nothing really matters all that much. And then eventually we get to where we want. So that's what I would say. I would say to my myself from 10 years ago, um, you know, just, just kind of graduating high school, like, hey, all this stuff right now, all the stuff you're worried about with high school and, you know, SATs and this college versus that college, how much of that shit matters now? None of it. None of it. So, yeah. I appreciate that. And I think... <laughs> I think pretty much everyone needs that sort of reminder daily, even those with kids as someone with a child. Although I've been, I've heard that once you have more than one, it suddenly becomes even crazier. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I, because not to go too much into this, but you know, when you have a kid, the thoughts that you have are as, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm really messing this up. I'm, I'm really, <laughs> I'm screwing them up. Like every, every day, every day you think, oh, I'm really, um, this is therapy. They're going to therapy. Like that's, that's just what yeah. you think. And the reality of it is, is no, like you're not, you're not breaking them <laughs> in that regard. Mm -hmm. It's like, nah, kids are pretty resilient and, and your ability to talk about it with them is what matters more. Like, yeah. oh, I feel this way right now, but, but you know what? It's okay. That's part of life, you yeah. know? So I, I can really appreciate the advice, Dan. And I think the listeners out there will too. So I, I really just want to say thank you again for being on here. I really appreciate you making the time and your busy schedule. My pleasure, man. I'm uh, happy to be on. I will shortly after this be going to the gym to uh, do some squats. So wish me luck there. <laughs> All the luck. And uh, everyone send good vibes his way because when you're listening to this, he'll probably be doing squats then too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, man. <laughs>